啊！This day begins on page 355 of your Book of Common Prayer, page 355. Yes, I Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, grant us so to be joined together, unity by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you reigns and with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Would you please be seated for this morning's lessons? A reading from the Wisdom of Solomon. God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living. For he created all things so that they might exist. The generative forces of the world are wholesome, and there is no destructive poison in them. And the dominion of Hades is not on earth, for righteousness is immortal. For God created us for incorruption and made us in the image of his own eternity. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his company experience it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you. endures but the twinkling of an eye is favor for a lifetime. Weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall not be disturbed. to you, O Lord, I plead with the Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the restoration glorify your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. 
Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this manner I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by competing it, completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. 
Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but she grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but trust his, touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt her body that she had he been healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see, and said, who touched my, <laughs> excuse me, you so see the crowd pressing in on you and how you can say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman knowing what had happened to her came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the, from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any longer or further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the, con of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them on, all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them to, that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. you please be seated i know i should have preached on the gospel today there's plenty of stories in that probably the great some of the greatest stories of healing ever written in gospel are in this gospel and it's very realistic he mentions that she was 12 years old and mentions everything that would say that this is really a right on thing and it taught when i was in seminary i learned that i'll just go I shouldn't even talk about this but i was told that the reason that the story of the healing comes in, in the between with Jer well, Jairus is the first with his daughter, and then in comes this woman that's hemorrhaging. And he said that they put it like this because it was probably the closest to the truth. Because in this story, life, it's, it's sort of like how life is. It's not a parable here and a parable here and a parable here, but here you see a whole page of life Put together so it really seems that this is very very close to the truth of what happened but saying all that and getting you all excited about that i i chose second corinthians to preach on today <laughs> maybe because it was easier i don't know but anyway i i thought it was interesting as you probably know if you've gone to church for any length of time sometimes churches can be tough St. Paul found this out from himself when he went up against the Corinthian church in his first letter. 
he discovered that the Corinthians were a rather wild bunch. They were always fighting with one another, tooth and nail. It appears that some of them had gone far beyond the norm in the displaying of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Shame on them. And others didn't like all that exuberance that they were showing. So they fought until they were totally out of control. They, thought for the, they fought for the very control, the very control of their church between the angry sides, and they all most, almost lost it all. Finally, someone made the wise call to bring in the big guns. They didn't know exactly who to call, so they got a hold of Paul. They hoped that the factions would perhaps listen to at least Paul. He was, after all, their prestigious father or founder. And so Paul decided he would write the Corinthians another letter. He had no idea how the Corinthians would react to his teaching in, his, in this writing, but he wrote because of his foundational position in this church and because of his love for all concerned. He loved these people. By the time Paul wrote his second letter to the Corinthians, it appears that the Corinthians had settled down a bit. Even so, Paul wasn't above a little pastoral sweet talk. Truthfully, as you all have probably figured out, I'm not above a little pastoral sweet talk myself at times. Uh, you know, every now and then. I have some, I've had some great teachers through the years. And Paul tells the Corinthians that they were just outstanding standing folks. They were just wonderful. They excelled in everything. There was nothing they didn't excel in. They excelled in everything. They were better than most in their faith, and how they followed doctrine and orthodoxy was way, way, way out of this world. They followed that orthodoxy and doctrine, and I can tell you there was absolutely no doubt that they were sweeter than the average bear in intelligence, and to their credit, they were eager to do anything that Paul asked of them. But then again, as I said, Paul wasn't above a little sweet talk to get them to do what he knew that God wanted them to do and what needed to be done. What Paul wanted the Christians to do was to get their eyes off themselves and attempt the first mission ever attempted by the, Christ by the Christian church, any Christian church that I know of, at least this one tells us of that story. In 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us that the church in Corinth, he tells the church in Corinth what his proposal for mission is. Paul tells them clearly that a call has gone up from the Christians and living in Jerusalem. The Romans have, were about to destroy Jerusalem, and the Romans were in, could do it easily, and the Christians were about to lose everything. Paul heard that the cry heard that cry and believed that the Corinthians could help. They could help. The Corinthians had settled their quarreling and they needed to focus their eyes on something besides themselves and their own problems. There were no doubt that the Corinthians had all the attributes they needed to do something meaningful to help. But the question was this, were their hearts right? Were they ready to focus on mission rather than themselves? That was the ultimate and primary question, and it still is. Paul knew that the Corinthian church had already begun to help the folks in Jerusalem, but much more was needed. After all, the church in Jerusalem started out as the largest of all Christian churches. Indeed, it was the epicenter, the very epicenter of Christianity for many years by this late date in the Christian community had become relatively small due to oppression on all sides, the Romans on one side and the Jewish hierarchy on the other. The whole Christian community was now in peril itself. To this, Paul pleaded his case to the Corinthians, begging and pleading with them to increase their outreach to their desperate brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. There was no doubt that they needed aid and they needed it fast and they needed it now. While we read Paul's letter, it is interesting to note that all the positive things that were happening in the church in Corneth, he talks directly to their heart. He talks to them directly about how in their abundance they should be willing to share. He tells them that if they believe that Jesus had given up all for them, 
that they should be willing to give up what they had to help Jerusalem and beyond. For Paul, it was a matter and question of the heart again. How much did they truly love? How much of what they said with their mouth was actually true in their life? There is no doubt in my mind that Paul could have been talking to any contemporary Christian American church. We have so much. We do everything right. All our doctrines are correct. We say all the right things. We, we, but do we look inside ourselves? Do we love enough? Are we kind? Do we care? Do we care enough to share it with others without flinching? Are we eager and willing to share the abundant gifts of God? Are we willing? Paul tells us to stop bickering among ourselves and to get out there and do mission. If we are truthfully truthful to our mission, our parish will be strong. If we get lost in ourselves, our parish will be weak. We have all the right doctrines in the world, but if we don't strive to give of ourselves, it's really all a waste of time. No one will listen. Why would they? We're just the same as everybody else. I don't know of a church like the one in Jerusalem per se that needs our help in quite the same way as Jerusalem. But there are plenty of ways that St. Joseph's can share its love. We need to keep our eyes and ears open to the needs of those that surround us. How well we act in times of need is a show of how our love is and concern. It is a love as a mark of our richness of our relationship with Christ. If our relationship with Christ is strong, the, the work of the church is strong. It's just that easy. We can do all things, but as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, if we don't love, it's just a big waste of time. It is. I am grateful for the many areas of mission that St. Joseph is already involved in. Truthfully, you are an amazing congregation. I believe our mission is why this church is strong, but we need to keep our eyes always open. We are not called to be ordinary. We are called to be extraordinary, and we can do it when we continue to allow the Holy Spirit to challenge us as well as to comfort us. Will our community see a St. Joseph's absorbed into its own politics, or shall it see the abundant sharing of what we have to offer? My bet, if I can say that, is one is on the continued love I see pouring out of this parish. You all, you, all of you continually allow me to see a better way of life, a better way of living. Please keep teaching me. I ask your prayers. Please keep teaching me and let us of all things be kind to each other and our neighbor and give to them as necessary and as, as God has called us to do. God bless each and every one of you. I've got an idea, silly as it may sound, I've got an idea. Let's join together to see where God is guiding us in love through all the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, what fun we'll have as we move forward in what God has called us to do and what Christ is calling us to do and how we can do it. There's a myriad, just a whole bunch of ideas and ideas and ways that we can branch out to serve others and to show and commit our love to them. Amen. Hallelujah. My friends, would you please stand with me and let us reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed here in your bulletin. We believe in one God, Father and Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and was 
made man. For our sake he was crucified and upon his side. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, and in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, to the Father and the Son, he is worshiped for our God. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism of forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are Form 6, found on page 392 of the Book of Common Prayer. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Bishop Glenda, Father Bill, seminarian Sherry, and missionaries overseas, for all bishops and other ministers. For all serve God and his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, remembering especially McKetta Crane, Reese Fitzgerald, Karen Pence, Becky Davis, Wesley and Kat Griffith, Darlene, Sam, Westcott, Patricia Beth Ann, Walter Folks, Kathy Hooks, Bernice Van Appeldorn, our Haitian student Lovely, Eleanor Taverino and her brothers, Sharon, Phyllis King, Howard and Shirley Cherry, Travis Brewer, Donna Frost, and Peggy Miller. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a plea place in your eternal kingdom. Peggy Miller and Janet Frick. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put, who put their, their trust, trust in you. you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your, your compassion, compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left updone and so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. My friends, my sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace.
Our service continues with Eucharistic Prayer C. It's on 369 of your Book of Common Prayer, page 369. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is right to give God and praise. praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, their planets and their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and have their being. From the primal elements, you brought, us, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, we are sinners in your sight. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you, pre you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of, a, of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By your blood, you have saved us. By his wounds, we are healed. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets and apostles and martyrs, with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope. To proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. So, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by the water and the spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his friends and said, take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption, and offering to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and his resurrection as we wait the day to come. Lord God of our, of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world, in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship 
from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Sisters and brothers, the gifts of God for the people of God. Just a note, all are welcome to come and receive communion. But if you take the wine, take the, the bread and dip it in there and then eat it this way. Uh, that's called intinction. But it's again, at this point in time in our history and life, it's to protect you and all of us. So there we go. Ron, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his Father and Father. Send us now in the peace of the peace. And the grants of strength and courage, love you to serve you, with gladness and singleness of heart. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst each of you this day, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Amen. tell you the church went a year and a half without any coffee hours and we're hopeful never to do that again until Jesus returns so I'm, not, I'm here to tell you that we do have coffee hour immediately after church you just walk through there and into the parish hall and we'd be glad to have each and every one of you with that let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the spirit alleluia alleluia thanks be to God alleluia alleluia Thank you.